ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد عن خطى الايمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القران ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد عن خطى الايمان دربنا درب قويم درب الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لن ينال الله لحومها ولا دماؤها ولكن يناله التقوى منكم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من وجد ساعة ولم يضح فلا يقربن مصلنا وكما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام الحمد لله all praises are for Allah Azza wa Jalla we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessings and for his kindness and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the bounties and the favors which he has given to us Allah has blessed us to be alive again in this season, the season which is known as the season of Hajj and Qurbani. And in this season of Hajj and Qurbani, two very, very great rituals that are in Islam are performed. We all know about them. One, it's the Hajj that many people have embarked upon and the other is the Qurbani and the sacrifice. And Allah has put these two rituals in a very sacred season where there are months which are known as Ashurul Hajj, Ashur Hurum, that the name of the months that Allah has placed these in are known in the Quran and in the Sunnah as sacred months and months of the Hajj and pilgrimage. They are sacred in the sight of Allah. That this season is so sacred that the Arabs at that time of the Prophet wasallam and before him, they used to get involved in many, many wrong actions. Even fighting among themselves, tribal wars. But when the season entered, though they were not Muslims and though they did not have Iman, they were mushrikeen, they were pagans, they worshipped idols, they didn't believe in Allah. But yet they had such respect for the season that they placed their weapons down. They stopped their fighting. They stopped all the other things, wrong things they used to do, especially in the haram, in the Kaaba. And that was because of the fact that from the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam coming straight down through the lineage of Ismail alayhi salam from which the Arabs came, they always understood that the season in which Hajj occurs is a very sacred and sanctified season by Allah. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the Lord of the universe and the controller of the universe and the owner of time and the controller of time. And Allah is the controller of every one of the actions that he has made compulsory upon us. And there is and there was always certainly a reason for putting certain acts of rituals at certain times. For example, Allah has commanded us to perform five times salat every day it would have been easy for any one of us to take one hour of 24 hours and perform the five salat one after the other it would have been easy or if you check it on weekends we could have done all for the week because we are free but Allah did not do so but Allah fixed it at certain times with great hikmah and wisdom why do you have to do it before sunrise? Why do you do, have to do it at midday after zawal takes place? Why do you do, have to do it at the evening and then after sunset and after? 
how, why? In every action that Allah has ordered us to do, He has fixed it with time because of the respect or the sanctity and sacredness of that time. And so to when Allah fixed things for us on a yearly basis, He also fixed it with time. Again, because of the greatness of the month that certain actions will fall in. So during the entire month, fasting which has been made compulsory could have been in any month. Muharram, Safar, Rabi'ul Awal, Rabi'ul Akhir, or Athani, any month. But of all the 12 months, Allah has chosen one month that is known as Ramadan so that the compulsory nature of us is put in that month. And so too, with respect to, for example, Umrah, which is the smaller Hajj, a person can go to visit the Haram anytime he wants during the year. He can do the Umrah at any time during the year, in any month. He can do it night or day. He can do it in any one of the days of any month. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, up to straight up to 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th. That's, he has that allowance. So the same Kaaba he is visiting in Hajj, he can do that in Umrah at any time. So a person is already visiting but when Allah instituted Hajj, He says, not any time. Not. You can't do that any time. You have to do that in the month that is known as Dhul Hijjah. And you have to do it during the days from the 8th, the 9th, the 10th, 11th, 12th. These are the days. If you do more than that on other days, you, it is not accepted from you. If you spend 364 days in Arafah, but you miss Arafah on the 9th of Zil Hijjah, you have no Hajj. On that particular day, you have to be at this particular place. And nobody has an option of doing anything besides that. So the fixing of this sacred pilgrimage in the month goes to show the blessedness and the greatness of the month itself and the fixing of these rituals on these dates that I have mentioned goes to show the greatness of these days in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is for this reason in a hadith recorded by Imam Tirmizi Imam Ibn Majan Imam Bayhaqi from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an he says that while speaking about the greatness of the month that we are in now, which is called Zul Hijjah, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَن يُتَعَبَّدَ لَهُ فِيهَا مِنْ أَشْرِ Zul Hijjah. That there are no other days on which worshipping Allah is most beloved to Allah than the 10 days of Zul Hijjah. No other days. No other days. The most beloved days in the sight of Allah to worship Allah as the Prophet ﷺ is saying is these 10 days. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fixed many things for us externally, physically. We can't recognize them and we can't see them with our eyes. But we can see them if we are true believers with the heart. We can see them with the heart. For a true believer, when Ramadan comes in, he knows it's not equal to the month before and the month after. For a Muslim who is not concerned, he sees the same day as the same day, the same night as the What's the difference for him? What's the difference for him? A Saturday is a Saturday and a Monday is a Monday. But for a Muslim and a believer, when that same Monday and Friday and Sunday comes in Ramadan, it's different from the other months. It's not the same. He sees with the sight of his heart that there is something special in these days and this month that is not there in the other months. And so to every week. We are living every single day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, Friday. 
for any normal human being and for any Muslim, a day is a day. But a believer sees something special on a Friday. He says, no, nah, Friday is different from the other days. You will not be able to see any special thing occurring with the physical eyes. We are not able to see that. But in the sight of Allah, in the invisible world, in the world which we cannot see with our physical eyes, a lot happens on this day which makes the day of Friday the king of all the days of the week. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sayyidul Ayyami Yawmul Jum'ah, the leader and the king of all the days of the week is the day of the Jum'ah. A true believer understands that a normal man cannot see that. Cannot see that. Everything looks equal for him. Everything look, looks normal for him. But with the sight of Iman, a believer can recognize things dif differently. With the sight of true faith, a believer thinks differently. He understands the value of time. Not as what a man will say about a, a, the time, but what Allah and His Rasul says about that time. A time becomes valuable when he knows in Islam it is valuable. So therefore, this is why the days are passing. It's normal days for us, like the other months. But what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? What did he say? The most beloved days to worship Allah, they are these days. This is why, when we look at the lives of the Sahabas radiallahu taala anhum, like Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu taala anhum, like Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu taala anhum. Like Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When we look at their lives, who were tutored directly by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who sat in all his majalis and sittings and meetings, who walked with him, who ate with him, who was always there. When we look at their lives, when the moon was sighted for Zul Hijjah, their ibadat and worship will increase and they will constantly be in the dhikr of Allah. While they are walking, they are calling Allah's name. While they are sitting, while they are lying down, while they are reclining. It is stated that when they used to go in Mina, even before they ate of Zil Hijjah, and because they used to travel from Medina to Makkah, so they have to leave long, a long time before because they used to go by camels. So they will arrive even in, before the month of Zul Hijjah started. And it is stated that they will engage in so much of the dhikr of Allah, the entire district of Medina used to be rocking and trembling with the dhikr of Allah. Used to be rocking with the dhikr of Allah. So much they used to be absorbed. You know why? Because they learned from the Prophet ﷺ himself what is the greatness of these days and nights. The days and nights of what? Zul Hijjah. That is why the Prophet ﷺ said that. And then, coming before the tent of Zul Hijjah is a very great day. The day that is known as Yawmi Arafah. The day of Arafah. For the pilgrims. One of the greatest days of the Hajj. A day which is filled with Allah's mercy and kindness. A day which is great not only for the pilgrims, but great for the non-pilgrims also. So you don't have to be a Haji or a pilgrim to reap the rewards of the night of Zul Hijjah, which is the day of Arafah. Wherever you are as a Muslim, in your home, in your city, while you are walking, while you are at work, you can reap the tremendous amount of blessings and rewards of the day of Arafah, which is the ninth day of Zul Hijjah. Anybody. For the pilgrims, they have different rituals to do. They have to be at a certain place. That's the law because they are there for Hajj. They have to be there. For us who are not performing Hajj, we don't have to be at any special place. Uh, but we are living. And when the ninth of Zul Hijjah comes in and meets us alive, we are meeting the ninth of Zul Hijjah, which is the day of Arafah. So it's not absent from us. And it's not hidden from us. And it's not that when the ninth of Zil Hijjah appears, we are not around. We are there. We are alive. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emphasized to us in the hadith recorded by Imam Muslim Alayhi Rahmah 
The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam encouraged us to observe the fast, especially people who are not pilgrims, that they are not from among the Hajjaj undertaking the pilgrimage. In that tradition recorded by Imam Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Siyamu yawm arafa, ahtasibu ala Allahi an yukafir sanat alati qabla wa sanat alati baada." That the fast of Arafah, when you fast on the day of the 9th of Zul Hijjah, obviously, the pilgrims and those who are on the Hajj journey, they are not allowed to observe the fast. They have a different thing to do. They cannot observe the fast. So those from amongst us who went for Hajj, we know what we had to do, and we also know we could not fast. But besides those, Pilgrims, those others like you and I and all the other Muslims, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, when it is the day of Arafah, the ninth of Zul Hijjah, and you observe the fast of that day, it is hoped, and I have that itimad and trust and reliance upon Allah, that the person who observes the fast. One year of his sins before, that's before the day he fasted, that will be forgiven by Allah. And one year after that day, it will be forgiven. So when a person observes the fast on that day, with firm faith, iman, with firm trust in Allah, and with the hope of achieving the rewards that are mentioned about that act of Ibadat, then he will get two of the his years of his life, the years of his life forgiven of sins, one year before that day and one year after that day. Obviously, when we recognize ourselves and we see that every single day and night we are committing so many mistakes, so many errors we are making in our lives, so much disobedience, and if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Some in some miraculous way is to show us or give us a glimpse of our book of deeds, which we'll get in the hereafter. We will want to, from that minute we see it until we die, we will be in the ibadat of Allah because we'll realize how much we have to make up for. But we don't have to wait to see that. We can examine our own selves, look at our own lives, check at our own self. Make and take a muhasab and a reckoning from our own self, and realize how far we are from Allah, or how close we are from the Deen of Allah. How much we are doing for our so own souls in this life and the hereafter, and how much we are not doing. Each human being, each Muslim who is sincere to himself and herself, they can examine, they can gauge, and they can come up with something that tells them that we still have to do a lot more. Each person, you don't have to ask a person to say what type of Muslim I am, or what do you think about me? Do you think I'm pious or righteous? No, you can tell yourself that. You can check the heart. You can talk to yourself, and from morning until night, from the time you open your eyes in the morning until the time you close your eyes at night, see the amount of things you have done, and you see what you have done is that is conforming to the laws of Islam, and what you have done that are against Islam and the teachings of Allah and the teachings of the Quran. And every day we can actually arrive at a conclusion: I have done done more good today, or I have done less good today. Each person can do that. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke, and he highlighted these things to us, so that you and I, as Muslims, while we live on the face of the earth, while we live on the face of the earth, we can do such things that can cause our sins to be forgiven. It can lighten our burden in the hereafter, right here while we are alive. It can lighten our burden. And this is from the rahmat and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa taala.
So the pebbles are jamara, the big jamara, the big pillar. We don't do that. They do that. Then they will also sacrifice the animals. Then they will also shave their hair or remove some part of the hair to come out of ihram. And then they will go to the haram to do tawaf al-ifadha. Of all the four, the four things that they do, one thing that is common between them over there and us, qurbani, the sacrifice. All the other things they have to do based on the location where they are. Mina. Then back to the haram. We can't do that. <laughs> we can't put up a pillar and throw pebbles there and say what we are doing the jamara. We can't walk around some masjid and say we are making tawaf al ifada. And there is no reason to go and shave your head on the tent of Zulhijjah because there is no ihram to come out and no Muslim should take two pieces of white cloth and wrap it around their body and walk the road and say I'm imitating the hajjis. This is not in Islam. But there is one thing we can do that is exactly in the same way they do, which is the sacrificing of the animals. And that is why that amal is so powerful, because it is common to every single Muslim living on the face of the earth, whether you are performing the hajj or whether you are not in the hajj. They have to do it and we have to do it also. So the whole wide world of Muslims are doing the qurbani and sacrifice. Subhanallah. Why do they do it? Only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many Muslims are not in need of any meat whatsoever. They are not in need of anything of that which they are slaughtering. But they do it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that is part of our deen and part of our religion. Whether you need it or not, on the days of Qurbani you offer a sacrifice to who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You offer it to Allah. You give this to Allah. Allah will accept it and Allah will return you with good deeds and blessings. That is why we do it. So, and that, subhanAllah, is a very, very great act of worship. So much so that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith recorded by Imam Tirmizi, مَا عَمِلَ إِبْنُ آدَمَ مِنْ عَمَلٍ يَوْمَ النَّحْرِ أَحَبَّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ إِحْرَاقِ الدَّمِ Subhanallah. There is absolutely no action that the son of Adam, a Muslim, can do on the day of Qurbani, the days of sacrifice, that is most beloved to Allah than the sacrificing of animals on account of which the blood flows مِنْ إِحْرَاقِ الدَّمِ no other amal. If you stand up in salat from the morning until the evening without leaving, that, that's not more beloved to Allah than sacrifice and an animal that takes about a few minutes. That cannot be. If you take $1,000 or $2,000 to purchase an animal to do your sacrifice and another person takes $100,000 and says, you only given $2,000. I'll give $100,000 in sadaqah. His $100,000 is not equal to your $2,000 that you paid for an animal and sacrificed to Allah. It is no way in comparison. And yours will be more beloved to Allah than his because on the day of Qurbani, it is not a matter of giving sadaqat and charity and feeding the poor and the needy. It is about offering a sacrifice to Allah and that is the objective of the Qurbani. It's not about who is poor and who is not poor. It's not about who is in need more of the meat because it's not about meat. That you think yourself, I don't need meat so... so so I don't have to do it or let somebody else do it or I'll send it over there to do it. They are more in need. Qurbani was not made for that purpose. If you have to behave in that manner, give sadaqat every day of your life. Send money to buy this and that and feed the poor and the needy. But when the day of Qurbani come, offer something to Allah. That is what Qurbani is about. That is what Udhiyah and Udhiyah is about. To give something to Allah as the sons of Adam alayhi salam give to Allah. وَطْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَبَنَيْ آدَمَ بِالْحَقِّ Why do you think Allah has ordered the Prophet to recite 
the qurbani of the sons of Adam, Cain and Abel. So we will be reminded that from the very first man on the face of the earth, qurbani was always done and sacrifice was always done by every righteous person. Allah says, rehearse to them. When the two sons of Adam, Cain and Abel, they offered a sacrifice to Allah. إِذْ قَرَّبَا قُرْبَانًا فَتُقُبِّلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمَا وَلَمْ يُتَقَبَّلْ مِنَ الْآخَرِ From one of them Allah accepted based on his niyat, based on his ikhlas, based on the fact that he really wanted to give to Allah and he gave the best of his wealth to Allah. Allah rejected the other one. Allah rejected the other qurbani because he gave something that was not good at all to Allah. And he did not have ikhlas and sincerity in his heart. And he was not God-fearing and righteous. Allah rejected it. So therefore, the Prophet ﷺ said, The most beloved thing you can do on the day of qurbani, on the day of sacrifice, any one of the three days, is to offer a sacrifice to Allah. That is far better than money. That is far better than all the forms of charities that you may give. That sacrifice that you will give. If you own an animal, so you don't have to spend your money, sacrifice it for Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنَّهَا لَا يَأْتِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ بِقُرُونِهَا وَأَشْعَارِهَا وَأَظْلَافِهَا he says, certainly on the day of judgment, this animal that you sacrifice for Allah, it will come up, Allahu Akbar. It will rise up. You will see it. It will be pleading on your behalf. It will be on your side. It will testify to what you have done for Allah. It will plead to Allah. It shall come with the horns, just as the horns were, with the hair, bi ash'ariha, and the hooves, and also the animal that have the wool, it will come. وَإِنَّهُ لَا يَقَعُ مِنَ اللَّهِ بِمَكَانٍ قَبْلَ يَقَعَ بِالْأَرْضِ And certainly, this meets the acceptance of Allah before the blood can drop. وَإِنَّ الدَّمَ لَا يَقَعُ مِنَ اللَّهِ بِمَكَانٍ قَبْلَ يَقَعَ بِالْأَرْضِ And the blood reaches the acceptance to Allah before it can fall on the ground. So can you, you, do you, can you, can we check how long it takes when you cut the truth for the blood to reach on the ground? Fast. Hadith says, much faster than that is that it reaches to Allah. Because Allah doesn't look at any other thing except at your heart and he has been looking at that heart all the time. This is why the Prophet said, فَطِيبُوا بِهَا نَفْسًا Do it with a willing heart. Do it with a good heart. Do it with the spirit that you want to give Allah something. You want to spend your wealth to give Allah something. Do it with a good heart. With a heart that is filled with that love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the spirit of sacrifice. That is why when we do qurbani, we should do it with a good heart. We should always do it in a manner that we love to do it and never think it's difficult upon us. Let us as Muslims not search for avenues where we can spend less. If you go to a person, you say, what's the cost of a share? He might say 1800. And then you hear, if you give five and 600, you can do the same thing elsewhere. Qurbani is not about monies and about being cheap and looking for avenues where you can save a few pennies and a few dollars. Qurbani is about the spirit of sacrifice we have in our heart that we willingly give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala something. And the more we give, the more Allah will accept it from us. So therefore, with these few guidelines, as we enter the season of Qurbani, let us take note of these points of the day of Arafah and also the Qurbani we are required to do. And based on the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, many of the fuqaha and the jurists, they have stated that those people who have the means to do Qurbani, then it is essential that they do a Qurbani and a sacrifice. One is that when the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina, every single year he lived in Medina for approximately 10 years and 10 plus years. He did a Qurbani every single day. And we know that the Sahabas and the Prophet were struck with poverty. Yet he did it. So he even along with that in another riwayat recorded by Ibn Majah, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ وَجَدَ سَعَهُ 
Walam yudahi, whosoever has the means of doing a sacrifice, a qurbani, and he does not do it, fala yakraban na musalla na, he should not even come close to our musalla, our place of performing salat on the Eid, day of Eid. So this goes to show warning, a strict warning from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's warning us, when you have the means, don't shove it away, but do it, do it. And that is why, as I said, many of the fuqaha, during the days of Qurbani, the three days, if anybody possesses the means of, has that amount of money, which is the nisab of zakat, which is about 2,000 and something, which was the last calculation of zakat based on silver, whoever has that means, then it is essential to do that Qurbani. Whosoever does not have the means, then that amount, then it's not wajib, but if you can afford, do it. For example, a person may not have cash, but you are animals, and you have about 20 animals. What's difficult to slaughter one animal? So you have the means, because put a, put a cost of 20 and multiply it and see how much you get. So you have the means, at least in the value of that. So therefore, this is something that we not, should not take lightly. And we do hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the tawfiq and the divine aid and assistance to obey him and to follow the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And with a willing heart and with goodness in our heart, offer our sacrifices to Allah and we beg Allah to accept it from us also. Wal akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Abadan lala al-nahid, abadan lala al-nahid, abadan lala al-nahid an khuta al-imani. Darbuna darbun qawim, darbuna darbun qawim bil huda al-Qur'ani. Abadan lala al-nahid, abadan lala al-nahid, abadan lala al-nahid an khuta al-imani. Darbuna darbun qawim, دربنا درب قوي مبين القرآن سائر في طريق الحق يا جند الله سائر في طريق الحق يا جند الله